I'm Liam. I'm a 16-year-old machine learning developer. I've been learning about AlphaGo that we did about it. So um, the paper, the name of the paper is Mastering the Game of Go Without Game of Knowledge. And it's all about uh, AlphaGo Zero. So AlphaGo Zero um, is a computer program that can beat humans at the Game of Go. Um, it's actually the second one to be able to do this. The main distinction here between AlphaGo Zero and AlphaGo is this doesn't use any supervised learning. Um, <laughs> it's also stronger than AlphaGo, and um, yeah, it's developed by Google DeepMind. All right, so what we're going to be talking about today, so brief history of AI and games. I think it illustrates a lot of the innovations that AlphaGo Zero made, so we'll be talking about that briefly. Um, then what is Go, and why should you care? Like, why does anybody care about this game? Um, and then we'll be going into the algorithm, how AlphaGo Zero works. Um, then the second half, we'll go through results, and then to discussion. So Minimax was one of the earliest um, game AI algorithms. And the way it works is basically exhaustive search. So it goes down this tree of legal move transitions. And basically it says, I'm going to do the best move I can do. And my opponent's going to do the best move they can do. And so this works perfectly if you search the entire tree. So um, it would see that, oh, in this position, I, could, I should go over there, right? Um, important thing to note here is this only works if you exhaustively search the entire tree, if you're just doing minimax. So that minimax on its own doesn't work for games like chess. Um, games like chess are way more complex than tic-tac-toe, as I'm sure most of you know. So for chess, we need um, heuristics. This reduces the search depth. So instead of having to go to the very end of the game, we could go to maybe here and say, OK, who's winning? And um, you can handcraft these heuristics. So we can say, oh, a queen is worth nine points, a rook is worth five points. And so in this position, maybe black's winning by a certain amount. And so you wouldn't have to search any farther in the tree to know this. Um, you can also do more um, subtle things, like, oh, a double pawn, maybe lose half a point for that. Or castling, you gain some points for that. So um, these can all be hand coded in. So Deep Blue used these two techniques, along with some other minor ones, uh, to defeat Garry Kasparov in the 90s. Um, the thing about this is it was basically brute force. Um, it was searched 126 million moves per second, and then used hand-designed heuristics. Um, so I would say this isn't very smart. Like Basically what it did is it just looked at every position going down uh, to a depth of about eight moves and then used hand-designed heuristics. It didn't learn them on its own. Humans had to design all these things. It takes a ton of time. So chess got defeated by Deep Blue. So researchers wanted something new to do. They chose the game of Go. Um, and we'll talk about why they chose Go. But in brief, Go is all about surrounding area and capturing stones. And so the way the game works, it's a 19 by 19 grid. And players take turns playing on the different intersections, alternating between black and white. Each color is um, one person. Once the stone is placed down, you can't move it. It stays there. And every piece is equal. There's no kings or queens or anything like that. Um, and so the goal of the game is to surround empty spaces. So in the bottom right, black is kind of surrounding that. Not quite, but you could see something like that start to happen. But right here, it's surrounding some space. So the details of this game aren't super important um, to understanding the algorithm. Um, but we'll just talk about one more thing. So capturing stones, if you completely surround a stone like that, then it's captured and removed from the board. This is the only time that stones will ever move. So the reason why AI researchers talk about um, or care about the game of Go is incredibly complex and it's hard for computers. So Go is so um, complex because the board, first off, is much larger. It's 19 by 19, so 361 grid points compared to Chess's 64 squares. Um, also, there's a much larger branching factor. So on average, in a game of chess, you can play in about 35 different spots. It's not 64, because pieces take up spaces and there's rules restricting that. In Go, you can play basically any empty spot on the grid. So branching factor is much larger. Also, in Go, games are about three times longer, so the depth is much larger. Um, and because of all these factors, Go is incredibly hard for computers. So if we just tried to do the deep blue approach on the game of Go, it wouldn't work. Um, as you can see in the bottom, basically Go explodes way faster in the number of possible games. Um, I think the number of possible games for chess, someone correct me if I'm wrong, is 10 to the 60. 
somewhere around there. Um, for Go, it's 10 to the 170. This is the number of possible games. And so there's actually more possible games in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. So brute force search won't work on this game at all. So let's go into how AlphaGo Zero works. So there's three main parts to it. Monte Carlo tree search, residual networks, and then a policy iteration self-play mechanic. So I'm just going to talk about Monte Carlo tree search in general, in case there's anyone here who doesn't know. Does anybody not know how this works? OK, so a few people. Um, so we'll just go through it quickly. So there's four aspects of Monte Carlo tree search, four stages, selection, expansion, simulation, and backpropagation. So selection, what it does is we'll have some existing tree already. So each node is a different, um, so this might be a game position, right? And then this would be one move, one transition in that environment. Um, and in this tree, there's only transitions to legal possible moves. You can't have like your king flying across the board, or in the game of Go, like the entire board like clearing. Like there's no point to put that in the tree. So in selection, what we do is we move down the tree and figure out what's the best choice to do here. And we'll talk about how AlphaGo Zero does this, but conceptually, that's the explanation. Um, then expansion, so once we've gone down through the tree, we'll add a new node to it to examine further. And so this is all done with the tree policy. Then what we do is, um, so sampling. So once we've expanded a new node, we're going to start running many random simulations, basically, using a different like move decision policy. It's called the rollout policy. And so you average all these values to get the triangle, or the average value for that state. And so the reason why I'm, oh, and then we back propagate that up the tree to send the values up. I'll talk about this in a bit more detail, and then ask questions if you feel like you're missing something. So some of the advantages of Monte Carlo tree search, it's a heuristic. And so basically what this means is since you're randomly sampling, and you're not exhaustively searching the subnode, you don't have to, you can go to the very end, even in complex games like Go or chess. Because um, in chess, you'd have to search however many billions of positions there are to get to the end. This one, you just randomly sample a few and take the average. Um, also, Monte Carlo tree search is online. So what this means is you can get a good estimate as you're going. The estimate will keep on improving um, while you go, as compared to Minimax, where you have to search basically the whole thing before you can get accurate results. Um, and because of this, Monte Carlo tree search works really well on large trees. And so for a long time, from about deep blue to around 2014, before AlphaGo, this was the main approach to playing Go. And it achieved about weak amateur level. Um, so not very great, to be honest. Um, so I used to play the game of Go, or still do a bit. And I would say I got to the level of Monte Carlo tree search within like a couple months of playing. Like it's not that strong. Um, so disadvantages, many simulations are required to get a good estimate. So this does put some uh, compute restraints on it. or Not restraints, but exertions. Um, there's also no generalization between similar states. So um, when we were showing these before, if this node and this node are basically the same, the tree won't know that. There's no generalization at all. Um, see, and performance is also highly dependent on the rollout policy. So if you're randomly sampling, like completely randomly, it probably won't do so well, especially if the game is large. So we need some way to design a better rollout policy or do something different here. So Monte Carlo tree search in AlphaGo Zero is a bit different. Um, there's four stages still, so selection, expansion, simulation or evaluation, and backing up on the tree. Um, one thing to note here, and we're going to be going into it, is there's selecting by Q and U. So Q is um, the expected value of that state. So the, the average of all the values of the children tree nodes. And then u is a confidence bound. Um, I'll talk about that soon. And then we have a few more things. I'll talk about those later. So let's go into the first stage, selection. So we have a big equation here. We're going to break it down. But basically, so q, it's the sum of all the values of the children's state, um, the average of those. And so we can think of that as like our exploitation term, right? If we know so far that it works well, we want to put that somehow into our selection, um, our tree policy. The second term on the right-hand side is exploration. Um, so C pucked is a hyperparameter. Um, it stands for upper confidence bound for trees. And so that's basically how much should we weight exploration. Then there's a few more terms I'm going to unpack. So state is just um, 
like the board state. Like um, in a game of chess, it's where the pieces are. A game of Go, where the pieces are. Um, action is a different choice you can make. So where can I play on the board? Um, this is where it gets a bit more hairier. So policy, P of S of A. So that's saying, what is the likelihood that I pick this action given this state? Um, and this is given by a neural network. We'll go into that in a bit. The right-hand side is um, what encourages exploration mainly. So the top term is saying, how many simulations have I done in total so far in this Monte Carlo tree search, like simulation, right? The bottom term says, how many times have I explored this specific action from this specific state? And so what this does is basically, if we've explored a ton of, if we've done a ton of simulations, but we haven't visited the state many times, that term on the far right will be a, a larger number. If we've done less explorations, less simulations, but we visited the state close to the same number of times, that term will be smaller. Um, so this encourages exploration. Uh, yeah? Is S specific on, uh, on the numerator as well? Sorry? Is S specific in the numerator as well? S. So, yeah. Because it's just one state. Yeah. So basically, it's given this. Here, we'll go back. So if we're here, right, um, it'll refer to all the child nodes, all the times we've diff visited different child nodes. And it's evaluating, should I go to this one or to this one? So top term, how many times have we visited all these children? Bottom term, how many times have I visited this specific child? Any other questions? Yeah? I think the question was whether or not it's that specific S is unique across the mall. Like it's always uh, the same S. OK. Um, so S changes. So if we're up here, that's a different state. Then once we move down, that's a different state. Yeah. Yeah. The other question is, you say average. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me unless I know what the values are. OK. So the values are um, 1 if the current player is going to win, and negative 1 if the current player is going to lose. And so we have to supply these values somehow, right? Um, but that's done by neural networks, and we're going to get into that a bit later. So the more the merrier. Yep. The higher the number is it. Yep, the more accurate we can get. Um, any more questions about this? Yep. What is this equation equals to? I mean, what's the, what does it equal to? Yes, yeah, so this equation, um, so this is the Q value, and the right-hand term is the U value. Our, our objective is to maximize this. Mm -hmm. What is this called? Is this Q, is Q plus U? Or? OK, so ignore it. if you ignore this term, right? Ignore the left-hand term, then everything on the right is just u. That's what u is. And this is called uh, the upper confidence bound for trees. Um, they have a slightly different implementation of it, though. It's, it's yeah. the score that you use to select which node you to expand. Yeah. So when we're selecting, good point. When we're selecting down the tree, we're picking, picking the maximum of q plus u. Not what we think is going to do the best, but what we think is going to do the best, plus some exploration factor. Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry, it's but you mentioned about that uh, uh, in the Monte Carlo uh, searching, uh, you are doing the r uh, random steps. I wonder that for the, for example, for the go, how many steps we are talking about? Because the, the possibility is huge. So. Yeah. A uh, very good question. So that's a uh, concern with depth, right? Like how mm -hmm. far are we going to have to go down? I'll come to that in a minute or two. Okay, but good question though. Yeah, um, yeah. When you choose a child to explore, you choose it deterministically based on this score, or you choose it probabilistically based on the probabilities of the Q plus U give you. So we can do it. It's done probabilistically um, when it's like learning, but when it's in competitive play, when it's being evaluated, then it's deterministic. But it, it's not the um, the absolute value. Oh, so. These selections are done by maximum. But when we actually choose a move, like to play, like in, in reality, it's done by how many times has a state been visited. Um, I will talk about this more later, but I hope that's good for now. Um, yes? Is there an intuition why it should be square root divided by this? Is there like a normalization condition or something? Um, do any of you guys know? I came across this. this yeah, so. there, is, there is a paper by Sitishwari where he says that this is a good uh, trade off. Uh, between exploration and exploitation. I don't have it at the top of my head. But, but from what I understand, it just controls the rate of growth well. Um, 
I don't have a better explanation though. Before yeah. we move on, could you just remind us again what CPOC was? CPOC, it's just a hyperparameter. So it could be between zero or one. Um, and it determines how much we value the exploration term. Yep. During the initial stages, uh, usually CPOC does uh, at a higher rate, so that it promotes exploration. But later on, I think after 30 iterations, it gets yeah. reduced to a lower state. CPAC is the discount rate. Sorry? This is CPAC is what we call discount rate. I don't think so. No. That's not my understanding. But look at the definitions. Like, like if you go next, yeah, okay. CPAC parameter, yeah, so maybe traits of exploration and exploitation. Yeah. Okay, so from what I understand by discount rate, my understanding of the term is the further down we go, um, the more important or less important C, uh, the discount rate would get. As far as I know, that's not true of this. It remains constant, and then we decrease it over time. Yeah? The discount rate is usually in the queue. So the mm -hmm. queue includes all the steps mm -hmm. forward, so the discount rate is usually included in the queue. OK. We good to go? Yeah. All right. So then we have neural networks. And so this is the neural network in AlphaGo 0 is actually pretty interesting. It's a residual network. And um, this paper actually came out shortly after or about a year after residual networks came out. So I think that's correct, a year and a half. Um, that's my understanding. Um, so it's a two-headed neural network. So it outputs policy and value. And so policy, for those of you don't, who, uh, who don't know, is basically like a plausible move um, suggester. Right? It would say maybe in this situation, 0.8% oh, chance, check this one out. 0.1, uh, check this. So it's just a vector over across all the possible board states. It'll be high for ones that we should explore and lower for ones that it doesn't think it's good. And then the value network outputs a value between negative one and one. And this says, so one corresponds to, I think I'm gonna win in this state, right? Let's say in a game of chess, if you're up a queen and a rook and whatever, you're gonna be pretty close to one, right? Negative one, you think you're gonna lose zero, you think it's gonna be a draw. And so the policy network um, reduces the breadth of our search Right? We don't have to search every different position. And the value network reduces the depth, so we don't have to look all the way down. Um, it's actually used slightly differently. Um, it's not just for depth, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so AlphaGo 0 has um, 40 residual blocks that it uses. There's also another version that uses 20, but I'll be talking about the 41. So there's input, then convolutional layers, um, batch normalization, ReLU, more comms, batch, and then a skip connection that goes up. And there's 40 of these blocks. Um, one thing that I think is interesting is, um, if you remember from before, Go, the game, it's like very grid-based, right? So that's why convolutions work so well on this. Um, OK, so the two heads. Um, so we have this huge residual network going up. And then there's two different heads. So the policy head outputs this vector of move suggestions. Um, so it's just a convolutional layer going up. Um, then the value head outputs a scalar between negative one and one. Um, any questions here? Yep. Yep. One more? Yep. So you have a policy of uh, A slash S, so that's state determining the action, but the other one's I prime. Can you explain that? Okay, yeah. So, um, Can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. So the question was, this is saying, given the state, what action should I choose? But this is saying, given the next state, what should I choose? And why is that so? Um, so my understanding is that it's the way that this is used um, in the Monte Carlo tree search. So I'll talk about it in a bit more detail. But what's going on is instead of doing a complete rollout of the entire game, and this gets to your question as well, we just assign the value from the neural network and then immediately back propagate that up. So that's why it's using the next state. Because it's like um, evaluating, is this one good or not? Yeah? OK. So two heads, I'll put different things. This is a vector, policy. This is a value between negative 1 to 1. And so then we go into training. Yeah? What is the input? Is it actually image? Um, so there's some technical details here. But basically, it's just the board and then the past 16 moves. Um, the reason why they need the past 16 moves is because there's some convoluted rules in Go that you can't like repeat positions after a certain amount of time. Um, 
as far as I know, it's not exploiting that as like an attention feature. It's mainly just so it doesn't break the rules of the game. And there's also one layer that says um, whose turn it is. And that's the input. There's no handcrafted features. Um, okay. So during training, there's three steps. And this can all be parallelized very well. So there's the self-play worker, training worker, and evaluator. Um, and in this section, we'll also be talking about how AlphaGo Zero selects its moves in a bit more detail. So what it does is it does 1,600 simulations on the Monte Carlo tree, um, trying to maximize Q and U. And so as it does this, um, each node keeps track of how many times it's been gone down to. So that's the N value. And then I believe we had a previous question that said, so how does AlphaGo Zero actually select its move? So what you do is you sample from the distribution of how many times you've visited each state. Um, and so during like learning, during exploration, um, it's n to the power of 1 over tau. And tau is a temperature parameter. Um, I believe it's between 0 and 1. I, I think it's set to 0 0.5. Um, but then during competitive play, um, it's, you don't use this um, exploration factor. It's just what state has been selected the most amount of times. And the reason why you don't do what state has the highest expected like average value is because you might have outliers. Um, and so you just want to do what's consistently been working for the tree search. So this is how um, AlphaGo Zero chooses its moves. So the self-play workers, so what this does is, um, here, I have a number. Sorry. OK, so AlphaGo Zero, using one network, it plays against itself 40,000 times, creating um, many like positions, lots of data for itself to use. Um, and it does this over and over again, 40,000 games. And so each position, what's stored is the game state, so the current move in the past 17, and the search probabilities, so where it thinks that it, it should have gone. Um, that's the vector from the policy head. And then the winner, the actual winner of the game. Um, so this is um, added to this like, experience later on. So once we know who actually won the game from like, the two neural networks fighting it off, then we put that back into the experience. Uh, quick question for yep. Omar. A uh, policy network is a distribution over the action space. It's not a game state. Right? Mm. Yeah, so it won't. So, so, yeah, so sorry. the policy network is the, the which we get from the neural network is a distribution uh, of the action space. And what's the like actions which would be more plausible in our case? So that's what we get. And we feed that as we decide to move down the MCTS. Okay. Um, if that clarified the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it's asking the output. So it's, it's uh, OK. Answers. Yeah, and it's only over legal moves. Um, I think I mentioned that before. But yeah, okay. so legal possible moves I can make. Um, and so this is all put into a big replay buffer of, 500, 000, of the 500,000 past positions. Then we have the training worker. And this is how um, these neural networks optimize over time. So our loss is defined as this. Um, I'll explain what the terms are. So this left term, this left term is um, z minus v squared, so mean squared error. And z is who actually won. It's the actual game winner. And v is the predicted by the neural network. Um, and so w each time, we sample a different position. And we say, OK, who actually won? And what does our neural network think is going to win? And we're trying to make the two correspond. So mean squared error right there. Um, the right-hand term is cross-entropy loss for the policy head. Um, actually, the middle term, sorry, the pi transpose log p. And so what we're trying to do is make the, um, the output of the policy head match with how the Monte Carlo tree search actually explored. So if the Monte Carlo tree search visited um, state A 80 times and um, uh, sibling state B 20 times, then we'd want that to be 80 and 20. Um, and then uh, for the term on that side is just a regularization term. Um, and so this is the loss equation. And over time, we're trying to minimize this via backpropagation. Any questions so far? So, um, mm -hmm. so is this done like whenever you want, to, when, when you're done uh, uh, your somewhat part of simulation? Or like when does this loss? Yep. Good question. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So when is this done? Yeah. Is this done like at the same time, in parallel, what's going on? Um, so what happens here is we play 40,000 games against ourselves and then send that off as a big batch of like um, a big memory, right? And then this is working on different workers, different GPUs. Um, so this could be generating new data and this could be working on old ones. And so it just trains from there. Um, and this does, I believe, 4,000 uh, training epochs. Do you have the number? For, for, is it 400 games? 400 games. Sorry. So the, the training loop samples a mini batch of 20, uh, 2,048 positions from the replay buffer. Um, and then does a thousand epochs of this. Yeah. I think maybe to, to just um, expand on that point mm -hmm. is that, or just to highlight something you actually yeah. said before, is that the, once you're playing games, but that the, the, the training worker actually is just randomly sampling parts in those games yeah. that have been played. So it's, you're, like, when we think of playing a game, I think we think of it very linearly, as in like, I now play a game and then I yeah. learn from that game. But that's not actually what's happening here. It's just you all the games are being simulated to figure out who's going to win, mm -hmm. and then you just randomly use that information distributed throughout the, all all possible samples yeah. in order to propagate the error in the policy. Yep. Because because you already know the result. Right. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's great. It's similar to how um, DeepQ networks do this random sampling of its experiences. Not exactly the same, but good analogy to think of. So, so yep. this discussion did clarify some of it, but mm -hmm. could you explain again the middle term? So the middle term? Pi and, and log. Yeah. So what's going on here? Um, we have the policy network outputs, the policy head, sorry, outputs some vector of probabilities, right? Saying given this state, 80% um, you go here, 20% you go here. Um, likely it's way more, right? But let's use, just use this as an example. And then we compare that against what we consider our actual. So how many times did Monte Carlo tree search choose this? Or how many times did it choose that? And we're trying to make the two match via cross entropy loss. So P um, yep. um, corresponds to the actions that actually took place, no. and pi P is from the middle left part. Pi is from the other one. Yeah. You just know the other yeah. yeah. So, so pi is actual. Yeah. Pi is actual. P is outputted by the network. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Same clarification. So this term is accessibility. So why is it log log p not the log not, not all the accessible terms, but p to the power pi transpose is the total number of accessible? I, I don't get it. Like wh why does it have to be the multiplication of the two? Why not just one of them is it? Um. So why are we transposing? Um, yeah. Okay. That because they are in the same dimensions, but I, I'm just not understanding why do we need two of why do, do we need two of them to define the the total number of accessible states? Because log omega is what I need to subtract, and omega here seems to be p to the power pi transpose. By what? So, okay. so, so means. Uh, this is based on pass input law, and so pi here is uh, is going to be your ground truth. Yes. So you, that's uh, that's why well that, that's uh, the expression why they're using that that term there. And so because pi is the is the actual action that's being taken, and p is the probability the output by the network. Okay, uh, pi is sort of artificially used as a label. And P is just the output of that. I want to maximize that the network actually outputs the quality. So if I use log P so if I use log P multiplied by transpose, that would not do the job. Log of P multiplied so like you mean P pi times uh, times pi transpose yeah. all inside the log? Yeah. yeah, it's not the proper probability distribution. I see. Yeah. Okay. Ready to move on? So after a thousand epochs are done from this training worker, each epoch having uh, 2,048 um, uh, size of the mini batch. Sorry. Yeah. Do we understand that, or do you want me to repeat that? So, training, what it does is 
does a thousand epochs running through this equation, and each epoch samples 2048 positions from this huge replay buffer. Okay. And then so after you do that, this result is sent off to the evaluator. But the evaluator can be running in parallel at the same time, and we'll see why in a second. So what happens is our data generation network, our previous be best network that was used to generate self-play games, this is compared against our new network that's comp uh, that was created by the training worker. And so these two networks play 400 games against each other. And if the new network wins 55% or more of its games, then it becomes a new data generation network. Mm -hmm. And so there's probably some questions coming up here, like why 55% or do you even need to do this? And this is actually kind of murky. And um, here, I'll, I'll touch on it now. So basically, they found you don't actually have to do this. Um, but they did it here, and it happened to work. Um, yeah. The, uh, the probability that you're selecting on noise, which is why they do the evaluator after 1,000. You have to speak louder. Yeah. Much louder. <laughs> okay, so one reason uh, from the paper, like one reason they do this step is because you want to minimize the probability of uh, incorporating noise in your training, which is why they do the evaluator function, just to do some due diligence. But you're saying that it didn't actually matter. Yes, yeah, so there's been open source re-implementations. I think a week or two ago, Facebook did one, and they I believe they used 50 percent. That worked fine. Oh, yeah. The person. Yeah. They're changing the percent, but they're still yeah. doing an evaluation. Yes. They're still, okay. Sorry about that. They're yeah. still using evaluation. Yeah. Um, okay. And so, <coughs> if you win more than 55 percent, become the winner and get to generate new data for everyone. Um, so let's just revisit this diagram. Yeah. The, Questions. The networks that are used in the previous step are they initialized randomly every time, or are they initialized based on weights of anything? Okay, so the old network and the new network used here? Is that yeah, the question? Every time you train up networks to yeah. figure out the new values that you're using, are you, are you just initializing randomly every time? No. Or you're, you're starting with where you were your best option yep. previously? Okay, so that's a good question. So, question for people on YouTube. Um, when we're creating these new networks, does it start randomly, or is it iterating upon the previous ones? So we have this... Um, data generating network, it's our current best, and then we iterate on it with this loss function. But while we're doing this, this is being d done in parallel, so we're not actually changing the network that's creating data. So we just do a thousand epochs of this, and then we compare, um, let's say like um, network F with network F prime, a modified version. And if F prime is better, then it becomes our new data, data generation network. Yep. So in a meta-learning con context, it's kind of greedy depending on how many actual neural networks that keep policy networks are keeping active at any given time. Okay. Greedy in the sense that you always are taking the you, you yeah, yeah. throw out whatever was before. There's no you can't back search on your networks if you're throwing it out and just accepting it once you've gone mm -hmm. higher than fifty five percent. Yeah. That's what I mean. Cool. Um, and so you know how I said you don't actually need this evaluation step? So, as far as I know, not true for Go. But you can do a similar thing for um, backgammon. So what they did is just randomly add noise to this neural network. So this was done in the 90s. Um, you can randomly add noise to a neural network and just do it like a hill climbing approach. And that worked well. Like that got world class results. Doesn't work for Go. So let's revisit this diagram. So like, how is AlphaGo is you're actually doing all of this? So we start with our current position in the tree. So that's our current state. And then we slowly expand different possible moves that we could be doing. And so to do this, we do Q. So this is the average value of all the, previous ch um, of all the children, plus U, so some uh, uncertainty bound or confidence bound. Um, next, once we get to a leaf node, we expand. And so as soon as you expand, um, you evaluate. You don't do a rollout in, as in normal Monte Carlo tree search. You just um, assign the value given by the value head the neural network and back propagate that up the tree. And then this gives you, um, so the policy head outputs probabilities and then we select a move to choose based on this when we're learning. So, yeah. So could you say that again also? Could yeah. you also remind us what uh, rollout does? Okay, so normally in Monte, Monte Carlo tree search, so we expand to a new position that we haven't seen before and then to get its value, we're going to play like tons of games just to see, and then average those and say, 
most of the time this works, most of the time it doesn't. We can't really do that accurately for Go. Um, well, you can. They did this in AlphaGo. They did rollouts, um, but this made it a lot more complicated. You had to have a separate rollout network, do all these things. So AlphaGo 0 just says, OK, just let me use my value network and estimate that. And this turned out to work pretty well. And then we get, from the policy head, we get, um, from the policy head, we get probabilities that we can select from, and we sample from that to choose a move. Ooh. Cool. Ah, okay. I might use this later. Um, that doesn't end up being visible online, right? No. Okay. Any questions here? So this is most of the algorithm. Um, so if you have any questions, like, uh, please let me know now. Could you elaborate a little bit more yeah. on the backup uh, step? Backup step. Okay. So right here. Yeah. So what happens is we expand to a new position, a new leaf. Our neural network gives us the value, and th this value gets put up to all its parents. And so then each of its parents gets a new average value for all its subchildren. That's what's going on there. So, yep. Uh, so my question is, we, now we know that some of these things are happening in parallel, but it's not as clear here. Okay. Um, so I'm just trying to kind of uh, picture it in my head, is like the, the select step, when you're playing the game, like let's say you, you've just initialized your network, you're playing the game, effectively you're just randomly taking steps yeah. through the, the process. When you expand a node, would that not be done, like isn't, wouldn't the expanding step be done by the evaluating worker? Mm. Like how, Wait, sorry, you were saying when you expand it, how does it... Yeah, 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 because, or, or, is it, or is it that I've never taken, does the network actually somehow not know that it's taken a step before, it's, it's, it's played some piece before, because the value would be zero, I guess. Oh, uh, okay. So, so see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. like the, the actual playing out, the actual simulating, mm -hmm. slash the actual evaluating, when you look here, is not as clear to me, um, okay. which, which of the workers would be doing what. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to assume that ca got caught by YouTube. Yeah? That's okay. So, which one's doing what? You know? um, which worker is doing each of these steps? Yeah. So, from what I understand, the self-play worker is doing basically all these things. Oh, it's doing all yeah. these things. Yeah. And then, an, so it's doing selection, expansion, evaluation, setting this up. So, this is done by the self-play worker. And then the training worker is just sampling from past positions. So that doesn't have to be part of Monte Carlo tree search, and isn't in the AlphaGo ah. zero algorithm. Yep. So the self-play kind of serves as generating training data for this, mm -hmm. the kind of like the step. But then what? What's what would the backup step? The normally back prop. You 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 Oh, uh, okay. I see. Did you see what I'm saying? Like what? Yep. So, so it saves yeah. the values, right? You can you can mm -hmm. reach that. Um. So it's not like back propagation of a network. Okay. Uh, sorry if I confused that point. So it's just going back up here um, and like increasing values because we keep the subtree that um, we actually play on and use for later. So you want to keep all these like previous values. Because yeah. the this actual training is happening in the train network, but just keep those so that they can see what actually was useful. Mm -hmm. is that yep. So it's just basically pi. This is, this is somehow how you're expanding pi. Mm -hmm. pi like, or no, am I still lost? Expanding pi. Pi from width, if you go back, yeah. go back, go back, there, pi. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. divided cool. by the uh, Monte Carlo tree search. Right, yeah. which is what we were just looking yeah. at. Okay, I yeah. think I got it. Cool. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, any more questions here? Yeah. So, how does this. I, I still didn't get the parallel part. Okay. So, you need to finish a game for you to get that final signal, right? So, so it's. Is that so? How, how is it parallel? How does it? Sorry. How, how is it parallel? parallel? You need to play parallel. all the games, yeah. generate the data, get the final result, mm -hmm. and only then can you do the, the yep. training work. Okay. So, question for you two people: How can this be parallelized if we have to wait for the value, the actual result z, to come back up? And so, this is a problem in the very beginning. So, if you haven't generated like any experiences, any positions to evaluate, then you're training worker will have to wait for that, right? 
and your evaluator is going to have to wait until a new network comes up. But once you get all these things going, they just work together. Because you'll have old positions that you can look at from previous games. Like, it doesn't have to be the newest game that your um, training worker is looking at. Does that make sense? So one produces mm -hmm. data for you, if that helps. And uh, well, of course, when that hasn't worked, you can't really do much. Your, tra your training can't really do much. But after you've accumulated a little bit of instances, then your training can go ahead and also train parallel. Um, so I think it's, I don't know if this is helpful for anybody else, but I think it's, it's less like thinking about parallelizing processes generally, and it's more like agile versus waterfall. <laughs> Does that work? Is that right? I mean, kind of. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's not like distributed computing, exactly. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, yes. So uh, I think maybe what I'm confusing you with is the term parallelization, yeah. right? So you can have multiple GPUs just doing self-play, all generating new data, right? You can have multiple GPUs all doing um, training, right? But these are each like kind of siloed off, right? And then they get new stuff coming in later, like new positions to evaluate, or a new network to try out, right? Yeah, I guess my question is that are you training? So when you start out, mm -hmm. do you have a class of neural networks that are playing generating data, and then they finish, and then you use them to create a new, like whatever he said, like a new network with new parameters in the greedy fashion. So then they need to finish again, right? Uh, like I feel like it's sequentially learning, improving, instead of but the moment second step is, is happening, the, that first one can keep going yeah, and yeah, generating more at the same time. Sure. Yeah. But but you've already improved in some sense over it. But it doesn't matter if it's incremental, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. If unless you're in like if you're assuming that the, the step from your previous win rate to your current win rate is a small step, yeah. then the, the, the last steps that are currently still in the pool, you still can keep training on those because it doesn't really matter. Right? But yeah. So you're still making some bad moves even though you've learned a little bit more about how to make better moves. Yeah. <laughs> so how fast is the data generation compared to the data, to the training? Okay. That's so the question was, how fast is data generation compared to training? I don't know. Anybody have an answer? <laughs> Not sure. I don't know. Not sure. My, my guess would be that MCTS is really, really fast. As long as it's, you know, properly implemented. Like, we, like Deep Blue and stuff. It isn't necessarily using MCTS, but like tree climbing can be very, 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 very fast. Um, especially if you had it have to parallelize. Because you can also parallelize each of the sub steps as well. And so another point going to that, you can set how many simulations you actually do before you choose a move. So they chose to do 1600, but you could do 6400. Um, and this changes like maybe how accurate or how fast it is. But you get to choose how many simulations you do. That are competing against each other. How are they different from each other? Is this like the new nodes added to some network, or or does that? Work? Okay, so we have a network F, right, that's generating us data, and then we're training a network F prime iteratively, trying to minimize this loss, right? We're just changing weights, um, and then we compare the two and see which network does better. Um, oh, sorry, question for the YouTube's. Yeah, okay, whatever, it's fine. So the architecture doesn't change, just the way it's... Nope, the architecture, there's no evolution. So they, they could alternate, like training training network could become the data generating network, or... Yeah, so... Or, or they, one could win consistently and would just be the data generating network. Yeah. For. So let's say your da data generating network is really good, right? And then for some reason, this training isn't, like, getting good enough. It's not going to become the new data generation network. It's only if it, the new network can get above a 55% win rate in this 400 game match. Right, I think we exhausted all the questions. Yeah. yeah. Please, yeah. let's move on to the next thing. So, five minute break. <laughs> <laughs>
Good. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. We'll have a question from Black. Um, sorry. 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 Okay. Question is in the expansion step. How does the instant evaluation without simulation happen? How does the network know what the two values are down the leaf, uh, down the leaf, a leaf node, without ever visiting those nodes down the tree? Okay. So, how do we instantly give this uh, value from the neural network? And so, my understanding of this is just neural network magic, like that we all know and love. Like it starts off bad, but um, if it's like consistently bad. It's not going to do so well, right? Like during um, this training, right? And it gets improved over time. Another interesting point, though, is it will likely be terrible at um, like early on in the game, but when it gets closer towards the end of the game, um, it doesn't have like as far to like search ahead, even though it's not doing rollouts, right? So um, I think I have a graph of that here. Yeah. So. Um, AlphaGo Zero actually learns like the later parts of the game, so that's the green and the orange, like earlier and better than the early part of the game, and that's because of this whole um, value backpropagation. Uh, it literally yeah. samples more of the possible search space. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Cool. Okay. I guess we'll just check along. So, um, a year before AlphaGo Zero came out, AlphaGo happened, um, and so. <laughs> There's a couple differences between the two. So AlphaGo Zero is entirely self-play. There's no pre-existing data that's learning from. AlphaGo um, does supervised learning from professional games and then does some improvement with reinforcement learning on it. Um, AlphaGo Zero, I think we mentioned this before, the input is just the game board, um, plus some like previous moves and whose turn it is. Um, AlphaGo had a ton of handcrafted features, um, like a bunch of Go-specific stuff. Um, also, AlphaGo Zero had a single network, whereas AlphaGo had two networks, um, because AlphaGo did rollouts, um, whereas AlphaGo Zero does, just does the instant value backpropagation. So those are the main differences between the two. And so the interesting thing is AlphaGo Zero actually eventually performs better than AlphaGo. And so um, green line is AlphaGo that was used to beat the world champion. And then AlphaGo Master, blue dotted line, is like the improved version. So use is basically the same as the AlphaGo Zero architecture. Like um, the network is the same, like a lot of the stuff is the same, except it still uses supervised learning. Whereas AlphaGo Zero starting from scratch actually gets better than that. Um, and so we have ELO ratings on the side. It just shows AlphaGo Zero, number one. Uh, yeah. Um, there's, I'm not sure if I have a training graph. No, I don't. Um, but basically, um, supervised learning AlphaGo learns faster, like at first, right? Because supervised learning, right? Um, the reinforcement learning self-play version takes a lot longer, but it keeps on going. Um, this is probably because like, in Go, like this self-play, we're just trying to get better, right? Supervised learning, you're trying to get better at predicting moves. Plus, you have an improvement thing, right? So slightly different objectives here. Um, so learning stages, I touched on this. Um, so Later parts of the game are learned earlier, but actually not as dramatically as I would have expected. Um, so match rate is actually pretty close, like within like 0 0.05 for most of the time. Um, and I don't have a good answer for why this is so. Like you would expect normally in Monte Carlo tree search that this gap would be bigger. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody have thoughts, let me know. Um, and then this is like a big limitation of AlphaGo Zero. So there's this thing in Go called um, ladders. And so basically black is doing the same two moves, chasing the white group, moving down, and then eventually it will be captured, the whole thing, right? But if you have a white stone in the path of this, then this ladder doesn't work. So it goes here, goes there, and then the whole thing falls apart for black. And so that white stone that like broke the ladder, that could be like across the board, right? And so basically, like the way like um, I figured this out when I was playing is you just like draw a little zig zigzag in your head, right? To see like if there's a ladder breaker in the way, right? AlphaGo Zero, like the best it can get, it still screws these up like 20% of the time. Um, and so th there's some interesting questions here, like can AlphaGo Zero not do like like why can't it learn this simple thing, right? This is like one of the first things that people discovered in Go, like 
2,000 plus years ago. Like, they discovered this, right? Like, why can't computers do it? Um, so there's probably some stuff about, like, the network and how it learns that it can't, like, learn these super long things. It learns, like, intuitional, like, value judgments, but can't do these things. Um, so, interesting. Um, and so alpha zero is a slight modification of alpha go zero, um, but it is pretty slight. Um, do you guys have the differences? I noted them down somewhere, but they are pretty minor. Um, okay. So in Go, um, the board is symmetrical. Like you can flip it this way and that doesn't matter, right? In chess, you can't do that because one person's on one side, one person's on the other. So they got rid of that um, symmetrical invariance. And then there was also, what was it? There's one more like evaluation feature of Go that they removed. And then everything else is the same algorithm. And so alpha zero uh, beat every other previous metric, beat humans and beat the previous computer programs, all from self-play. So against Stockfish, when it played white, it won way more um, than when uh, Stockfish had white. Stockfish, like when Stockfish had white and alpha zero was black, they had draws basically all the time, 97% of the time. Whereas when alpha zero had white, it won 29% of the time. So pre pretty big improvement there. And Stockfish for the longest time was the strongest program. Yeah? Um, I don't know if this is obvious to you for play chess, <laughs> but is the difference between white and black besides the color, which I'm assuming is relevant, the order of yeah. the player? OK. Yeah, so um, in chess, a uh, person who's white goes first. That's the only difference, but it, apparently it gives a pretty big advantage here. Um, another interesting thing is um, Alpha, alpha Go Zero and Alpha Zero discovered that white actually has a pretty big advantage in Go. And so in Go, white plays second, but they get a six and a half point, um, points in return, like in compensation. This is called Comey, but basically the goal of that is to like even it out, to say each player wins 50% of the time. Alpha Go Zero found like this isn't the case, like maybe it should be reduced to 5.5. And this actually corresponds to like um, a lot of what pros have been saying recently. They've been whining about this, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then finally, in Shogi, which I don't know a ton about, but like Shogi is also like another very complex ch uh, chess game. I, as far as I know, it's more complex than normal chess. Could be wrong, but um, it also does way better than the previous computer programs. And so, yep. Uh, sure. I was just wondering, how are the chess pieces presented, or Shogi pieces? Because in Go you have white and black pieces, yeah. but in chess you have you know queen, king, bishop, knight, all that stuff. So. Do you have an idea about how they are represented for the convolution okay. neural network part? Yeah. So question for the YouTubes, it's um, how do we represent these different pieces? Because in Go, it's just presence of black stone or white stone. In chess, you have different pieces. Do you guys know? My assumption is game rules have to be, uh, game ru my assumption is game rules have to be incorporated as well. It has to be a knowledge piece as to if it's a pawn, like, which, what kind of moves are logical. It's my assumption. But do you have a different feature playing for kings and a different feature playing for pawns? I would uh, assume so. That would be if, my assumption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, I would assume so because it, it has to be like sort of an image. So yeah. Okay. So my guess, and I think this is right, you have different feature planes for each type of piece. Probably different for the different colors too. Yep. Yeah. Um, because I'm um, sorry, I, I think I didn't mention this in Go. There's different feature planes for black pieces and white pieces. Um, and th then the past moves, like previous states, right? Um, similar thing in chess, but you have different ones for each piece. This is my guess. I'm not sure about that. Um, and then the other thing is, all, the only other thing you have to do is implement the game logic. Um, say, like, be able to give the alpha zero, like, the list of possible moves it can do. And from there, it can learn uh, basically any two-player perfect information game. Um, you can also teach it stuff like Othello, if any of you guys know that, or Connect Four. Um, what else can I do? Yeah, basically any two-player perfect information game. Um, that's all we have here. So, Alpha Go Zero's gift. So this is like where I wax poetic about Go. But from, I started playing Go when I was about in grade six, so about five years ago. Um, and so like from grade six to grade nine, like all I did was play Go, like all the time, right? And so um. I made it to Canadian Nationals, competed there. That was a lot of fun. But that same year, AlphaGo, not AlphaGo Zero, but AlphaGo, uh, defeated the human professionals. And so this is what got me into artificial intelligence in the first place. Like, I wanted to build these bots, right? Like, um, 
a, a big motivator of why I played Go is because humans could beat computers in this game. You couldn't do that in chess, right? Um, there's also a lot of stuff about Go, like when professionals, like the top professionals play Move and they're asked why, a lot of the time they'll say it felt right, you know? Whereas in chess, and like, this isn't to say like Go is all about like feelings and stuff, like you do have to read ahead positions, but there's a lot of intuition. Whereas in chess, you have to like memorize like tons of openings, that wasn't fun to me. So I played Go a ton, right? Off of Go beat humans, I started doing artificial intelligence. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. But while I was doing research for this project, I started playing Go again, went to the U of T Go club again, and some other ones. And a really interesting thing is AlphaGo Zero, um, not AlphaGo, AlphaGo Zero has changed the game of Go. Like it rediscovered a lot of human knowledge about this 3,000 year old game, but it's also le learned a ton of new things. Like um, I was playing against someone and we were doing like some opening and he played something new and like I responded bad. And like when we went back over the game and like reviewed it, he's like, oh, here's what AlphaGo would have done. Like, and this is common, like they're saying this all the time about openings. It learned um, like straight up, it's called like cash or territory is better than like influence a lot of the time. Um, this is hard to explain if you don't know Go, but like it learned a lot of new things, like new corner patterns and a lot of new strategies. And it's influenced the game a ton. Um, and so this is in stark contrast to chess um, and Deep Blue. So I'm not a chess aficionado, but as far as I know, like when Deep Blue came out, like all that happened was like people were like, oh, we're shit, like compared to computers, right? Like AlphaGo Zero, it's like, oh, we lose to the computers, but we can still learn something new from them. Um, yeah? So, I mean, I feel like I probably know the answer to this, mm -hmm. but like, does that mean that people can then get better enough that it <laughs> loses badly against AlphaGo Zero until yeah. you can, like, train it more? Like, can you see that variation yeah. happening? Um, so that's a good question. So, like, humans have, as far as I know, like, ELO rating um, among the top professionals has been slowly climbing. However... How do, what, what does that mean? Um, so ELO rating is um, like a numerical measure of how strong a player is. So I think a uh, hundred point difference in ELO is like one player will win like 60% of the time while the other does 40. It's just some like scoring metric, right? So humans have like gotten like 100, 200 points better since the advent of AlphaGo Zero. The only problem is AlphaGo Zero climbs faster, right? And you can just throw more compute at it. I'm sure someone will come up with a new network. So I don't think humans are going to beat the computers. But human has, has the rate of increase of human performance mm -hmm. accelerated yes. since oh, yeah, okay. Slightly, yeah. Um, like people are learning new things. Yeah. Um, yep. One of the interesting things I think most people do is that uh, collection of humans playing together against anything yeah. kind of beats, uh, beats the best computer. Yeah. Uh, have, has anyone tried something like that with AlphaGo Zero or any of the others? Okay. Or if not, do you have an opinion on what, what might happen? Okay. So the question was, um, a collection of humans could, um, at one point, could beat the best computers in chess. I'm not sure if that's true anymore. Um, and so I know there's also a thing called Centaur Chess, where basically a human and a computer would play together. And a human and computer playing together can beat a computer playing on its own. And like. I don't play enough chess to know why, but like this just happens to be true. So the question was, is this true for Go? Like if humans and computers playing together are better in some way? So no, I was, I yeah. humans playing oh, against. multiple humans okay. computers. Okay, so as far as I know, that's not the case. Um, they still get beat by computers. And um, there was some like competitions they did with like a Centaur Go, where like a human and computer played together. Um, but they only did it against another human and computer. So it's not clear um, whether like that offers any improvement. I think there's also yep. another interesting analogy here. So for instance, if you look at AlphaGo Master, it's essentially the same network as AlphaGo Zero, minus the human intuition. And the human intuition is from a database of the expert um, yeah. moves. So my understanding is if you collect a number of um, best players, I mean, uh, the best moves known by humans should be incorporated in the database. And if that's the case, uh, AlphaGo Zero up, still up from, up performs that. So if you look at uh, the AlphaGo Zero okay. versus Masters, this is more of an intuitive way to look at it. There's still a level of that that's like the act of codifying it, right? Like you can you can have the human move is generally like this, but maybe there's something that doesn't, I don't know, maybe if you're constraining it so much, it's just this mm -hmm. board position, that board position that doesn't yeah. necessarily apply. But it seems like there should should be something that's lost in that codification. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's true. I hope like humans working together could like 
do better oh. than this. But um, as far as I know, that's not the case, unfortunately. Um, so we have ladders. So I think the really interesting thing here is like computers just like starting on their own, like entirely through self-play, no previous data, can like discover new things and like really ancient games. Um, yep. One thing I will say because um, I've been following the chess side of Alpha Zero is that uh, like to your point when you know, Deep Blue beat Kasparov, it was more like yeah okay they can compute more things than us. Um, but I feel like the reaction from the chess community uh, after Alpha Zero came out was that it it has an intuition for like long term compensation. So uh, like a rook being worth five points, bishop being worth three points. Those were the heuristics that humans had, but it showed that in certain positions, it's actually very happy to sacrifice a rook for a bishop for a long, like this is like 20, 30 moves and things that couldn't possibly calculate with yeah. the algorithm. So it's interesting. I feel like with Alpha Zero, uh, people are seeing, kind of asking the equivalent questions like, what is Alpha Zero going to do in yeah. chess? Um, because now we kind of see that, oh, it has intuition, has imagination. Mm -hmm. um, compared to before where it was just brute force calculations. Yeah. So in chess, um, like when people were playing against Stockfish and stuff, like everybody would say like this feels like I'm playing against a computer. Like there's something different there. Um, but when people see like Alpha Zero playing, um, I don't play enough chess to say, but like Kasparov and people like them, like the top chess professionals, so like this looks like a human, but like at peak performance plus a hundred. Like it plays pretty amazingly, right? And um, the really cool things, like as you were saying, right? Like it will like ignore these human heuristics sometimes. Like it might sacrifice like a rook if it has like if it sees like a super amazing attack plan, like to get checkmate in like twenty or something. So some really interesting things there. And so this has like kind of encouraged like chess players to be a bit less lazy. Um, I'm not saying they're normally lazy, you know, but like not just say like oh I gain a rook in this trade I should just do it, right? Like you have to think through more. Um, yep. Okay. Um, sorry, I wasn't listening, but someone asked, what about exploiting the weakness you noted earlier with respect to ladders? Uh, ladders? Uh, okay. Um, so early on, um, so before AlphaGo Zero, um, back when it was just AlphaGo, AlphaGo Lee, so when it first came out, AlphaGo played a five game match against uh, Lee Sido. Um, and Lee Sido actually won one game. Um, he found some minor exploit. It was, I, I forget what it was exactly, but basically like AlphaGo wasn't valuing a certain part of the game right, right? And similar thing happens with ladders. The only problem is AlphaGo zero, like its error rate on ladders is only 20%. And you can't like, you can't set those up like all the time, right? Like it doesn't work that well. And like, even if it does screw up on a ladder, like it just outplays you in every other way. Like you're just gonna fall behind. Um, but yeah, that is a question, like, good question, like, can you exploit it? And as far as I know, yes, a bit, but not to the extent that you could win. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering when you came across that, that human response, that, um, which, which one do you say plays like a computer with chess? Um, like Stockfish or okay. Deep Blue, yeah. Um, did you come across anything that, like, articulated what that meant? Like, what does it mean that something uh, feels like a computer? Like it's very, it's more predictable. It feels like really consistent, or like. Good question. I'm so curious. Yeah. Does anybody know what it, it means to play like a computer in chess? I'll take a stab at it. Yeah. Um, I think what that means is, like, the computer doesn't have a strategic understanding of the game. So humans, like, we think in pattern and say, okay, this is a good position, and long term, this should eventually convert to a win. Uh, computers. Stockfish uh, being the main example, like it would do, it would have heuristics, but it would do mostly just kind of brute force computations. Obviously, it does more than that, being the best chess engine in the world. But uh, so, what actions might you, as a human, perceive and judge as weirdly like so, not intuitive? Yeah, one example would be um, you might take a kind of the stockfish might take a really defensive position and say you don't have an attack. Um, and to say, I looked 20, 30, 50 moves ahead, you don't have an attack, I'm saying. But to a human, it might look really scary because you know all the enemy's pieces are coming for you, um, and, and it doesn't look safe. 
So that's kind of where the intuition versus brute force comes in. Um, there is also one thing maybe uh, the usual chess engines uh, are more materialistic. They're more materialist, they're more material oriented, right? Yeah. And when Alpha Zero came out, at least from the games I watched, uh, it was very, very, very strategic. Mm -hmm. Actually, like, give up material or not care about material. Material meaning, like, pieces? Yeah, like yeah pieces. pieces. Yeah, yeah. Like if you have the chance, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have the chance to capture a piece, yeah. chess engine would pretty much do it all the time if it yeah. sees value in it. Yeah, but Alpha Zero would, would go beyond that uh, and, and, and undermine the position even further. That's, that's, I guess, what people felt the human element. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you're just not talking about what's in here. It's a war strategy. It's called grand strategy. It's the battle that we the war. Another interesting fact, um, I'm not sure if this is true of all chess players, but when Alpha Zero first came out, um, Alpha Go Zero, they're like, ah, whatever, doesn't really matter. Who cares about Go? But then like once Alpha Zero came out, and like people started going through the games that I played on chess, like there's been like an explosion of interest in like the chess, some of the chess community at least. Like there's a lot of attempts to like open source this, uh, to re-implement it, as there have been for uh, Go. Okay, I guess it's a question for everybody. Uh, has anyone tried something like adversarial examples in this context? Huh. For example, states which would defeat a given network. Okay, um, so I'm not sure if anybody else has an answer. As far as I know, there hasn't been like any like specific like research into this small area, but there has been the thing with ladders. So basically, what you could do is you could make like a bunch of like theoretical game positions where like the um, the outcome is determined by reading this ladder. The only problem with that is like that won't actually happen in a game, like to such a large scale. Um, but there hasn't been any specific research, as far as I know into adversarial examples. That'd be interesting, though. Yeah. Do you mean like adversarial examples that are digital, or do you mean human adversarial? Or I guess it's a question on the thing. I think it's digital. I'm guessing that two games playing, two alpha goes playing against one another is, the, is an adversarial example, yeah. right?